Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone, assalamu alaikum. And uh, let me just go to the, the talk that I'm going to give today will probably be the last one of these things on, uh, on action, functional and symmetries, which is really space-time symmetries. Uh, so let me just go through. Uh, So I put my German uh, university uh, address there already, even though it's not official yet. So uh, basically there are two things that we want to cover in this talk, is basically the uh, spinner fields, and then uh, we'll, we'll revisit uh, direct spinners and uh, direct matrices after that. So uh, let me just recap from the previous talk. So we introduced a uh, local infinitesimal transformation for fields uh, by using the Poincaré or the Lorentz group. And then uh, for the spin half fields, we generate the rotational transformation by uh, poly matrices. But then we have to remember in space time, you have to consider boosts. So we need to generate boosts as well by poly matrices. Okay. But now the, the parameters for this uh, boost transformations are given by complex parameters. And taking both sides of the complex parameters uh, will give rise to the, the two-handedness of the spinner fields. So the thing that we have uh, sort of left off in the previous talk was to talk about relations between the left-handed and the right-handed spinner fields. Uh, given by this, for example. So let me just go back to the previous uh, slides of the, 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 the slides of the previous talk. So we had that you know, sort of uh, giving you the uh, the relationship uh, between the Lorentz transformation on left-handed and right-handed spinner fields, and then uh, using those. Uh, these are just by uh, examination from from this uh, particular uh, equations here. So the difference between the left-handed and right-handed is just the the the, the signs given by this uh, uh, parameters uh, of the boost. Okay. So, and then we found out that, okay, if you consider uh, the left-handed spinner and you take the complex conjugate and multiply it by the uh, sigma two, okay? And then you'll find that that object will transform like uh, a right-handed spin. So in other words, uh, there is a relationship between the left-handed spinner with the right-handed right spinner by considering uh, objects like this, okay? So you can do for the same if you just consider uh, this object from the right-handed spinner, uh, it will transform as the left-handed spinner. I think that was the last thing that we did uh, last time. So let me go for today's uh, <clears throat> talk. So, uh, so we had that. I hope everyone can get in fine. Uh, please uh, voice out if you have anything to ask. Okay. Where was I? Okay. So uh, one of the things that we want to start building uh, from the representations of your, the spinner representations of your fields, okay, uh, is essentially, okay, the, the aim is to get a Lorentz scalar, okay? But uh, there will be steps in between, sort of telling you how to build scalars, and then you find that the scalar needs to be joined up with other things uh, to give you a four vector, and then from the four vector, then you can build the Lorentz scale, okay? So that's what we're going to do today. So just a kind of reminder from quantum mechanics, uh, if you if one takes uh, two spin halves, then you can uh, either make a symmetry or anti-symmetric combination. Then uh, you get uh, the spin triplet for the symmetric case and the spin singlet for your 
uh, anti-symmetric case. So in a in a way, this is analogous to the anti-symmetric case. Okay. So what we do is we take uh, two uh, left-handed spinners. Okay. So we have uh, psi l and chi l. Okay. Again, uh, from from this point onwards, I'm just uh, carrying out uh, carrying on with uh, Ramon's uh, book. Okay. Uh, so you have this uh, half zero uh, representation of spinner. Okay. So and then you consider uh, this particular object. This this is essentially like, like some kind of an inner product. Okay. So you get uh, this object and then consider uh, how it transforms under uh, Lorentz transformation. Okay. So the, your psi L will transform like lambda L psi L and chi L will transform like lambda L chi L. You can see the, uh, the pointer, right? Somebody? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, this part, you know, because of taking the transpose, you, you reverse the order, and then uh, you'll be able to get uh, this relationship, which I've seen earlier, and that uh, uh, that sort of simplifies to sigma 2. And then what happens there is like saying that, okay, under the Lorentz transformation, it just goes back to the same object. So in other words, uh, considering this kind of product between the a particular uh, spinner, okay, you'll find that it produces a kind of scalar. Okay. So now what one can do is, okay, let's try to re uh, replace your chi over here. And remember that this psi and chi will be two different spinners. So let's replace your chi here by your psi. So it says uh, taking a sort of... A, a product within the same spinner and what do you get you'll find that okay uh, just enumerating out the what you call the elements in your spinners okay this from the, from the spin up and spin down some components if you want and then you put your sigma 2 there and then you have your transpose there okay and what do you get you get this uh, uh, equation which is you no know, okay uh, if these are numbers and we will get to uh, in a, in the, the next slide if these are numbers meaning psi l1 and psi l2 commutes then this will be just giving you zero okay so here the only way if you want to maintain uh, this to be your sort of uh, product between spinners you know, that's it. Okay. Uh, between, uh, between the spinner and itself, then you'll find this problem of having zero product if they are numbers. Okay. So a way to resolve uh, this kind of thing is to consider a different kind of number for which the, the numbers here are actually anti-commute. And these are sometimes called the uh, Grassmannian uh, numbers or Grassmann numbers. And uh, if you have done any form of high energy physics, uh, you probably have come across Grassmann numbers. They are actually representing fermionic fields. Uh, and uh, no, one can adopt this if you want to, okay? But if you adopt this, then you have the problem of, uh, no, uh, you don't really have a way of understanding uh, Grassmann numbers in the normal way, okay? So you need to be careful of how the ordering is going to be, okay? And then uh, if, it's, uh, if it's the same number, for example, psi L1 and psi L1 here, then you know that it's going to be zero. So this gives you, uh, it gives you the uh, uh, a kind of relationship with uh, what they call superspace. Uh, you have seen uh, supersymmetry before, then uh, that's related to that. Okay. Uh, another way to, to consider is to replace your chi L in your previous slide over here. Okay. You have chi L being different from psi L. Uh, is to replace it with 
a different object which is related to your sign L, but now is given by this uh, uh, object by psi R conjugate multiplied by your sigma 2. Okay. And this, with this, you will find that, okay, you can proceed just like uh, the, the normal way of you know, multiplying matrices and numbers. And then uh, this can be considered as uh, a way of introducing uh, your scalars, if you want, into your uh, action function or the Lagrangian density. Okay. Okay, let's move on. So this is only half part of the story. Okay, remember uh, the way we think of your sigma two here are generators of rotation. So one needs to uh, supplement this with how does it behave under boost? Okay. So under boost, you remember uh, your parameters here are complex. Okay, essentially uh, there's supposed to be I there, but now your I disappear because of this uh, V is now. So having a, another I, so I sort of replace your I when well, minus I and I with plus one. Okay. So your psi L dagger psi L, which appears before, oops, um, did I miss out a particular line? Yeah, probably have missed out something. But anyway, one of the things that, okay, from, from over here, uh, you feel that, okay, this kind of thing will give you scalars. You can, let me check with my notes if I miss out. Sorry about this. I yeah, miss out something is not also on my notes. But okay, uh, the idea is to consider objects like this, okay, which are supposed to uh, transform like a scalar under rotations. But when you do it for the case of uh, boost transformation, uh, you find that, okay, if you do uh, this transformation over here, then you'll find that, okay, uh, it doesn't give you quite the invariance that we want, okay? So in other words, we have an extra term here, over here, okay? Which is not your original thing, okay? So in other words, uh, these objects are not invariant on the boost, okay? So to sort of, uh, to proceed, Okay, uh, we also need, if you look at the, this particular form, okay, the, the, the form that appears here involves a, a psi dagger with a sigma and then psi here. So we would want to consider what kind of uh, effect happens on this object under the boost transformation as well. So again, we try to do this. Okay, so you, you form your, you know, no, in this particular case, uh, because of the, uh, okay, you have the transformation over here, but you also have uh, transformation for your sigma as well. So you get, by right, this should supposed to be some kind of a uh, dagger here, but since this is going to be uh, now just like a real thing, so you just give you the same thing, okay? So, and then if you expand out your exponential over here, then you will get your, no, your terms, uh, the ori original terms here. And then you have a, an extra bit, which involves the anti-commutator of your uh, polymetrix. And you know how to, to solve this. This give you uh, the epsilon ij k, uh, sigma k, 
and then you'll be able to, to reduce it to, uh, to this particular form. Okay. So you now you can actually see, let's make a summary of this. The changes that happens to this kind of objects is that uh, this one will change to that. Okay, you have this additional term, and this one will change to that. So somehow these two objects are sort of intertwined. Okay, so uh, then it's probably necessary to put these two things, these two objects together. Okay, and in fact, if you can think of it, this is like uh, you have one component here, here you have uh, three components. So you can assemble this, this objects, okay, these two pairs of objects, okay, into a four component object. Uh, the only thing that's going to be additional here, here you have your sigma there, which comes from your poly uh, matrices. Here, you can think of putting an identity in between, okay? So your, you consider your identity, uh, the two by two identity matrix as sigma naught. And then this becomes like, okay, it looks as if, okay, I can combine sigma naught with sigma i to give you a, a generalized uh, poly matrix, okay, which is given by sigma mu. And this sigma mu, okay, um, well, the whole object uh, will transform like a four vector. I think I did something wrong here. Yeah, I, I didn't put you know, backslash new there. Uh, so here is basically epsilon, what is it, E? Yeah, it's supposed to be epsilon mu nu, V nu. Okay, this is how a four vector transform under uh, Lorentz transformation. And it, this is precisely the kind of thing that you have over here. You have your V here, okay? And then multiply by that object, okay? So it natural, uh, naturally combines into a four-component four thing, and it becomes a four-vector. So the four-vector is now, it's a, uh, one of the things that we have to be careful when you uh, put things inside your action function, it has to be a geometrical object, okay? So in this case, uh, four vectors and a, a geometrical object, and you can uh, consider those into your, uh, as part of the terms inside your action function. So you can now put your i psi l dagger sigma mu psi l, which is consists of your zero component here, and then your, your spatial components. And you can do this, this again, the same thing for your left hand, sorry, your right handed spinners. Okay. The only difference over here, your sigma mu, because this, this is now thought of as a, a four vector. Okay. Uh, you have to make a, a difference for the case of the, the, uh, the right handed spinner with a bar there. So that the difference there is, is in the third sorry, in the, the three last components where you, instead of a plus here, you have a minus. Okay, so you have that. So now if, so those will be scalars under both uh, rotational transformation as well as boost transformation. So if you want to, uh, now, remember that these two objects are still having a free index mu. Okay, so it's a four vector. Okay, so in order to, to consider Lorentz invariant uh, objects inside your Lagrangian density or your action functional, then one has to contract that free index mu with another index mu, and normally one thinks of this as your you know, derivative. In fact, you really want to have your derivative, uh, I, I'm not sure that I've uh, mentioned this, uh, your derivative gives you the equation for motion. Okay? So, uh, so naturally one can combine this with the derivative to form Lorentz invariant objects such as this, or this, or this, or this, okay? Is that all right, everyone? Uh, 
I suppose it is so going to be. I have, I, have, I have questions. Okay, go on. So, so, so every time, do we have all these four pairs, right and left, or we can be either one? We normally consider both. Oh. Okay, we will we'll come to that. And we'll, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, it's a bit difficult because in 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 the okay the left-handedness and right-handedness symmetry is actually broken in one uh, type of force, the weak force. So there is a, a sort of a symmetry between the left and the right-handed objects for weak interactions. Okay, so uh, sometimes. Uh, 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 for the weak interactions, for example, you consider the left-handed spinners, so it appears as a doublet, okay, with the two, two, what you call two component thing, uh, whereas uh, for the right-handed case, you consider a singlet. So there's a, a sort of, you no, know, a symmetry uh, breaking there in some sense, okay. Uh, to do that, uh, we have to go into particle physics. So I think we, we will avoid that at the moment. Now we are just concerned that how are you going to uh, build your action function? Okay. Uh, I have I have questions. Sorry. Okay, go on. So so just now we consider let's say two half, two spin half, right? Yeah. So so I uh, that, that one give you all uh, two half. So electron electron, for example. Yeah. Uh, so if we have like combinations of half an integer, it works as well for this case. Let's say half, is it, is it a, a good question? Okay, uh, you mean other fermions? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, the rules are a little bit more complicated. In oh, okay. So but, sometimes you have to go through, through case by case. So okay. I'm just uh, focusing on the spin half at the moment. Okay, but, but it should have some similar construction. Oh. Yeah. Uh, okay. The 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 most of the particles that you're going to to observe in you know ordinary particle physics uh, interactions are spin half. Uh, there are spin three halves uh, yes. that are coming from supergravity. So let's not go into that. <laughs> okay. So now, okay. One of the things that we have already seen that there is this relationship between your left-handed and right-handed spinner. Sometimes you want to consider consider them both. Okay, so what do you do? You assemble these two representations in in one object, and this is essentially what we call the uh, four-component Dirac spin. Again, uh, this normally works for most interactions, apart from probably uh, weak interaction. Okay. So with this, you can also do something else, which we call as a parity uh, transformation. Okay. So what what the parity uh, operation does is simply to swap the left-handedness and the right-handedness. Okay. And this can be done by uh, this matrix, this operator, the parity operator in some in some sense, uh, and. This is actually uh, in this particular representation is uh, defined as your gamma norm. Okay. And uh, again, this one just simply swaps the left handedness and the right handedness. Okay. What if you want to make a projection on one particular handedness? For example, you want to project on left handed spinner or you want to project on Right, and the spinner, you have another operator which is given by uh, this object over here, which is one plus or minus gamma phi. And what's gamma phi? Gamma phi is simply the identity here, zero, zero minus identity. And this is sometimes called the chirality operator, and it has uh, uh, the eigenvalues plus or uh, minus or plus one, minus four. Uh, left-handedness and plus for right-handedness. So I think we're almost done. <laughs> so it's going to be a short talk today. OK, oh, yeah. So from, from the direct spinner, 
one can also form scalars simply by referring back to, to the previous, uh, I think, uh, okay, now I've forgotten about the, the, the thing that we have actually seen earlier was the different, the, the, the handedness are the same, okay, but the, the object that we have seen much earlier on, okay, let's go back. Okay, uh, the, the object that gives you uh, the scalar behavior, okay, uh, modulo the, the, the boost behavior, okay, uh, is given by this, uh, no, taking the, the different handedness over here, okay. So, uh, uh, going back to this, where will we? So, uh, so this will be now a scalar. Of course, I, I'm removing all your factor of i in this particular case. And then uh, this can be formed using the direct spinner. Remember the direct spinner is given by that. Okay, psi L, psi R there. So this is four dimensional. Psi L is two dimensional, psi R is two dimensional there. So uh, you can make it uh, using the gamma knot, okay? and you get this particular combination. And uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and you can define this object because this appears most of the time because you want a scalar, right? So this will appear most of the time. We define this as psi bar, where psi bar is called what we call the power Pauli adjoint. Okay. So now, uh, given this kind of, of scalars that we want uh, to build in, then uh, remember we want the Rolland scalar as well. So you, um, uh, you consider the, the partial derivative together with your uh, generalized Pauli there. Okay. And this will now, okay, uh, be. So this is like a two-dimensional thing, okay? Uh, sort of embedded in a four-dimensional case. Uh, how should we say that? Uh, yeah, uh, your sigma mu Yeah, I remember we are, we are still using the two component spinners here, okay? So that's, I got confused a little bit. So now if you want to use the four dimensional spinner, then this sigma mu becomes your gamma mu in this way, okay? So here we write the gamma i, the gamma naught is the one that we introduced earlier, okay? And then we essentially get almost uh, like what you have seen in your derived equation, okay? Uh, the arrows that uh, sort of showing both directions says that, okay, you can take your derivative in both directions, okay? And this gamma mu, uh, since we have already introduced it before, just let me remind you, okay, uh, your direct matrices, gamma mu, gamma nu, uh, under uh, what you call anti commutator okay? I must see Poisson bracket there. Eh? Uh, anti commutator then this gives you uh, your metric tensor, okay? And your currentity operator, in terms of your sort of four-dimensional gamma matrices, is given by just multiplying out all the possible uh, gamma matrix from uh, the, your direct matrix multiplied by I. Okay. One final thing that uh, I think I want to stop uh, uh, at this particular point because uh, no, there, there are things can be said even after this, uh, but I think I want to leave this topic. I think it's already uh, sort of went through three different uh, uh, talks already. So I want to leave it with this particular point that you can consider an associated spinner, okay? With respect to the direct spinner, you can uh, sort of 
multiply your components in your direct spinner by sigma 2 and also at the lower component by sigma 2 in this this particular way and you you define what is called the charge conjugation or charge conjugated spin and this charge conjugated spinner is a sort of a, uh, it's an atom well I mean, it's, what do you call that uh forgotten the word for it uh, so when you when you take it twice you get back your 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 original spinner and so your charge conjugate charge conjugated spinner is important because you will sometimes you like to uh to describe particles with okay they have the same uh the same properties like the original particle but the only difference will be a, a uh, difference of charge, electrical charge. Okay, so this is our, what happens under the charge conjugation. Okay? And you can have a special kind of spinner called Maurana spinner, for which uh, it will be constructed in this way. Why is this a special case? Because under charge con conjugation, no, it just returns back to the same uh, spinner the four-dimensional spin. Uh, I wanted to put in uh, some remarks, but no. Uh, there is a thing, uh, you see, uh, I can't remember what the, the is it automorphism? So the, uh, when you apply the, the, the operation twice, you get back, you no know, sort of uh, the same thing, okay? Uh, so there are, three different uh, uh, operations that you can actually do on quantum fields, okay, which is your parity, which is one of them, and you have a charge conjugation, that's another one, and then you have a time reversal, okay. So this gives you the CPT uh, uh, connection with uh, quantum fields, okay. And uh, one can sort of uh, include those uh, sort of uh, discrete operations. Remember, they, they, are, they are just like Z2 kind of thing. Okay? Uh, you can include those uh, discrete operations into a, a bigger group, which is sometimes called an extended Lorentz uh, group, okay? which uh, I can give you a, one reference to, 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 to look it up. Okay. So I think that's all for today. Sorry for this short talk because I don't want to go too much into the, the other topics of that chapter in, in Ramon. Okay. So I think that's it for today. Uh, any questions? Uh, you have to voice it out because I can't see you. Okay. So I, I got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Why why you need to construct a scalar object uh from the spinner? Well or what is the purpose for that? Well uh this this okay the, the basically uh the thing that we want to have in your action functional is a Lorentz scale. So that when you go to a different uh reference frame, you no. Know, the physics doesn't change. Is that good enough, or do you want? So uh, just so like you, you like... want to construct the function uh, action, you need scalar. Lorentz scalar. Oh, Lorentz scalar. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. So okay, in understand. this way, then okay, if you if you, if you go to a different ref reference frame. Uh, the physics itself doesn't change. Okay. So, bro. Yeah, go ahead. Um, in your slide, I think, um, just now when you mentioned about the possible resolutions, so you're not using the Grassmann numbers, right? No. Uh, over here, then you can write all the the components with just 
uh, ordinary numbers. Of course, okay. uh, you have the option to do that as well, okay, which we have not actually done. Uh, what happens if you do that instead? Then, okay, you have to cope with how to deal with uh, Grassmann numbers, which uh, require, okay, uh, what happens when you uh, differentiate that or what happens when you integrate that, you know. Uh, you can do it if you want to, okay. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's something that, that normally one goes to a slightly more advanced quantum field theory, okay. You so can if we, lead to, if we lead to the same answer, I mean, like same description. Uh, okay. Uh, um, okay. Simply, simplistically, yes. Okay. Uh, I don't want to no go because I'm. I've not worked with them for quite some time, so I'm not. Uh, I have not checked them properly as, as yet, but I will expect that to be the same. Okay. So the ones that we are we are having with the Grassmann numbers, you no, know, you you should be working with the, the four dimensional thing. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, or do you want me to uh, turn off the? <laughs> Recording first. Okay, maybe yeah, I should. Turn off the recording. Okay, I'll turn off the recording. <laughs>